So uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, for a few reasons. I'm not going to discuss the work of Doug and Nobu. Uh, for one thing, they're two of my favorite economists and don't need comments by me. And I've written lots of work, and my students have, which is built on, on their work. So I want to use my time today instead to talk about some work in monetary theory that's not represented at this conference, even though I think it's important. And, and this conference is entitled Money and Banking, and so I want to tell you about some of this work. So missing from this program is work which builds on the following proposition. And uh, imperfect monitoring is necessary for money to be essential. And uh, there's some italicized ter terms here, each of which has to be defined. So first of all, what is money here? In terms of this proposition, it's outside fiat money. Uh, uh, you want to think about the analog in the actual economy, think about currency. Uh, I'll define perfect monitoring for you. Anything else is imperfect monitoring. Perfect monitoring just means past actions of everyone are common knowledge. What does essentiality mean? That's a term borrowed from Frank Hahn. It means the presence of money improves welfare. Uh, I and students have done a lot of work in which we've tried to think about optimal policy in settings where money is essential like this. The history of this proposition, uh, Joe Ostroy, 1973, sort of has this proposition and never really did much about it. And here's some subsequent work that, uh, that does some, uh, that both had these ideas and this last paper published in an obscure place has a proof in a somewhat general environment, but this is meant, this is meant to be an, in a proposition that is environment free. And uh, I'll talk a little more about it. Now that's a proposition about what's necessary for money to be essential. There are, are there going to be sufficient conditions for money to be essential? Not very likely. Uh, so today, I'm going to start from one specification with extreme no monitoring and generalize it so that the model bridges the gap between two extremes, no monitoring and perfect monitoring. And I'm going to use it to study optimal seasonal policy. And, you know, why do this? I'm going to do this for, for a, a couple of reasons. Um, one reason is, uh, is that the uh, optima in either of these extremes is obvious, and I'll describe it. Uh, but the optimum f for the general case of some of the of some monitoring is, uh, is not obvious. And, uh, and in the context of the seasonal model, is uh, maybe surprising to some of you. So let's start right in. And uh, bear with me. I have a total of eight slides, but I'm going to ask you to learn a little model. Uh, so this is. Uh, Pretty, this is two 1995 papers, uh, discrete time with a non-atomic measure of agents. Each maximizes expected discounted utility with discount factor beta between 0 and 1. People meet in pairs at random in this model, and a person is a consumer with probability 1 over k, is a producer with probability 1 over k. And the setting is there are no double coincidence meetings. Uh, I was hoping there'd be a blackboard here. Period utility is if you're a consumer and you get to eat the good you like to eat, 
you get utility u of y, where y is the amount you get to consume, and this function u goes through the origin and is strictly increasing and strictly concave. So I would draw it if I had a blackboard, but have that picture in your mind. If you're a producer, you realize this utility minus c of y, and for purposes of this talk, think about c of y as being linear going through the origin. Okay, and this u and c function is that the y that maximizes the difference between u and c is y star. And I might mention right away in this model, uh, the first best we could ever have in this model is that y star is produced in every bilateral meeting. Now, these 1995 papers had no commitment on the part of the agents in the model. That's going to be maintained. They had no monitoring at all. Uh, so everybody was a stranger in this model. And money holdings were in the set zero one. So what I'm going to do today is generalize this no monitoring assumption. There's a large body of work on this model. It would take me all day to talk about all of it. Uh, <clears throat> so t today's extension is based on a paper m published in 2009, so it's kind of a little old, but there's no danger. Probably the number of people who have seen this work is uh, less than a handful. Uh, so we're going to have ex ante identical agents, like we're the people in this room, and with probability, but there's a measure of us, and with probability alpha, each of us is going to be part of the set of perfectly monitored people, and the rest of us are going to be non monitored. And, uh, and we're and that fraction is going to be exogenous. The fraction of monitored people is, uh, is going to be denoted alpha. And uh, monitored status and producer-consumer status are common knowledge. So when you meet somebody, you know whether they're monitored or non-monitored, or whether they're a producer or a consumer. For monitored people, Histories and money holdings are common knowledge for N people, for N for non-monitored, they're private. You want to think of the N people as the underground economy, although it's a very benign underground economy, and the M people as the above ground economy in a very extreme way. We know the histories of those people's actions. Many people here are sort of interested in almost cashless economies. I'm not going to talk about that today, but the way you do it is you'd look at the limit as alpha goes to one. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a seasonal here, and how am I going to put it in a seasonal here in a very simple way. I'm going to make this cost of producing output, I'm going to make it a constant C sub H uh, in winter, and another constant C sub L in summer, H for high and L, L for low. So this is a two-period seasonal model. In winter, it's costly to produce. In summer, it's uh, less costly to produce. Any questions? So, you know, this is a simple model. I like to think about it. You can hold this model in your hand. Okay. I'm going to be talking about Optima in a set of two date periodic and implementable allocations. Okay. The state of this economy is going to be very simple entering a period. It's going to be just two numbers, the fraction of monitored people who have a unit of money and the fraction of non-monitored people who have a unit of money. The state of a meeting is going to be there. 
when you think of S as being the producer and S prime as being the consumer, and the state of a person is whether they're monitored or non-monitored and whether they have money or not. And an allocation is going to describe the state of the economy and trades and meetings, including post-trade monetary transfers. And an allocation is two-date periodic if the law of motion, uh, if the state of the economy is two-date periodic. And an allocation is implementable if each trade is in the associated pairwise core and the transfers are individually rational and incentive compatible. So this is a model in which people meet in pairs. I'm not going to choose a bargaining rule. I'm just going to have the planner choose the trade subject to the trade being in the pairwise core in the meeting. Why do I do this? I don't want my conclusions about policy to depend on a particular bargaining rule. So what's the optimization problem? This is ex ante maximization when, when before our type monitored or non-monitored is determined and before money holdings are assigned. And the welfare criteria is just the expected gains from trades in meetings weighted by the probabilities of the different kinds of meetings. So, you know, this model is, is very simple. And at the extremes, I, it's a pencil and paper model when no one is monitored or when everyone is monitored. Uh, but when we look at values of alpha like a quarter, uh, I don't know the implications. So we're going to do a numerical example. And here it is. Don't worry about these parameters. Uh, except to notice that this discount factor is high enough in this model so that if everyone were monitored, we'd get the first best supported by threats. And if, uh, if no one was monitored, uh, it, it's also simple. We'd want to have half the fraction, half the people holding a unit of money. And uh, when a consumer had money and a producer did not, we'd get the first best. So we're almost done. Uh, so what is the optima for this example? A quarter of the people are monitored. Uh, I don't do calibration, so you might sort of think that this is Afghanistan or something. I don't know what it is. Uh, I'm just trying to learn something about the properties of this model. So what does it look like? So the fraction of M people with money so first of all, so there are two columns here, no intervention and intervention. What does no intervention mean? No intervention has the planner choosing everything I said, except that the planner is subject to having a constant money supply across summer and winter. So no net transfers. Uh, okay. And what does intervention mean? It's allowed to have a different money supply in summer and winter. So what happens here? Uh, so the planner wants to have all the monitored people have a unit of money. That kind of speeds up trade, puts in a position of trade. Here's the fraction of non-monitored people with money. You will notice that it's, uh, it's higher, well, so it's the same here and here, but here, under intervention, it's higher at the beginning of winter than at the beginning of summer. So that may seem a little surprising. Uh, summer is the high trade season, but we've got a bigger money supply at the start of the low trade season. This intervention, uh, optimum. How is it supported? Well, the interesting thing about it, in this model, when I talk about policy, I don't distinguish between monetary and fiscal policy. It's all consolidated. And yet this optimal policy, it looks like a central bank policy of extending net loans 
to monitored people at the beginning of winter and having repayment at the beginning of summer. So a very counter to the idea that the money supply varies with the needs of trade. By the way, and you know, we know in this example, we're giving loans to these monitored people, but end people benefit from the intervention and monitored people are hurt by it. And yeah. So this is one example of a of a body of work which sort of builds on this proposition that I started with. That proposition is interesting in, in lots of respects. Um, we're used to these days in thinking about cryptocurrencies as thinking about the informational structure that supports various uh, things we used to trade with. This proposition about monitoring points in that direction in the sense that it says you should look at trading instruments, currency, bank deposits, credit cards, in terms of the informational structure that supports them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil.